Abby Oprint, uh, who's uh, with ERS. Um, she's a research economist in the Food Economics Division and has done research on uh, uh, food consumption, obesity, and nutrition. She joined ERS in uh, 2010 after finishing up her dissertation. So please come and take a seat at the head table. <laughs> She's going to talk about consumer preferences, the uh, priority related to uh, consumer preferences. Hopefully by understanding consumer preferences more completely, we can do a better job of... No? Excellent. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, by, by doing that, we can uh, uh, do a better job of fulfilling their needs. Uh, maximizing their utility and so forth. Okay. Norbert Wilson. Where is Norbert Wilson, please? All right. Come forward. Come on down. I could say, come on down. I shouldn't say that. Uh, okay. Norbert Wilson is professor of uh, agricultural economics at uh, Auburn University. Uh, he's a member of the Auburn University Food Systems Initiative and the International Agriculture Trade and Research uh, Consortium. Uh, Norbert's going to be talking about uh, food security. Now, you'll also see that written in the book as food insecurity. Our objective is food security. What we want to do is get over food insecurity. Okay. Will Martin. Hey, Will. Uh, Will Martin's going to be talking about development and trade. Uh, I think it's important and that... Conflict. Pardon? And conflict. And conflict. All right. Good. Uh, I think it's important that we uh, look more completely at these international dimensions. Uh, Maybe we don't have enough in there. That's a question I'll leave with you. Maybe we don't have enough in there now about the international perspective. So Will's going to challenge. I, I think Will will challenge us about that. Will is uh, currently senior uh, research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, previously with the World Bank. Uh, he talks a little funny. Uh, he comes from Australia. Uh, but uh, we certainly... It is English, though. <laughs> and Keith Goble uh, is going to be talking about big data. He's uh, interim department head at uh, Mississippi State, the guy's distinguished professor of agricultural economics, and uh, he was a key person in organizing the pre-conference on big data. And so he's going to wrap up our panel discussion. Each of our panelists will have five minutes, so it's not very much time. You're just going to get a glimpse of that one. So you want to go back and read the details and see what we need to do to better communicate these priorities. So Abby, we're going to start with you. You can you want to speak from there, or would you like to stand here with the microphone? I'll take the microphone. Okay, there we go. Um, so what I'm presenting here today on the understanding consumer preferences as choices is based on opinions from the CFAIR working group and not necessarily those of USDA or ERS. So the working group discussed a lot of issues related to consumer food choice and diet outcomes and food available to consumers and how our skills as ag economists can be used to solve some of these issues. So some of the issues that uh, was brought up in the working group that, um, that we now face and that will likely be problematic in the future include um, poor dietary intakes, obesity and health outcomes, and that's not just in the United States. Many countries suffer from um, poor diet, um, having poor diet and obesity. Uh, also, we discussed food safety concerns as being um, a problem faced by consumers. Food waste in production and consumption. Uh, we also talked about this disconnect between what consumers want and what producers think consumers want. And here, there, there are large um, investments in scientific research and development, but often the results are not consistent with consumer preferences. And lastly, we talked about addressing sustainability of food choice and diet, and how production, production systems um, can respond to growing heterogeneity and consumer food attributes, given that demand is driven by quite different incomes and preferences and information sets that people have. So we identified six kind of key questions where we think ag economists can make a contribution to address these issues that I just talked about. Um, the first is how do we create a food environment that allows households to balance health, 
sustainability, safety, and affordability. This is the classic trade-off question that we're always trying to answer in economics. So some questions related to that are, how does the food environment, including information, product displays, prices, food access, affect consumer choices and health outcomes? Um, also, what are the trade-offs in managing sustainable households? What are the drivers of unhealthy eating? I know we have a lot of research on this, but I don't think we've solved the problem yet. <laughs> and then, what are the tensions and trade-offs of food safety, nutrition, and food waste? The second key question um, that we think ag economists can really contribute to is, what are the characteristics of a sustainable food system that meet consumer preferences and internalize external costs and benefits? And related to this, a relate, related two questions are what factors influence levels and um, levels of consumer trust in the food system, and what are the costs and benefits of different food systems? A third question is how and where do food safety problems arise in the food system? Um, how effective are current and potential approaches to ensuring food safety? What are the trade-offs between accessibility and affordability in achieving a safe, accessible and nutritious food supply, and where does consumer sovereignty fit into this whole system? Uh, fourth question, how do food retail companies make decisions such as where to source their food items and what uh, foods to offer to consumers? What are the implications of food deserts? How do we exploit ret retailer cons um, scanner data to answer these questions, and how does the organization of, food, of retail food affect food choices made by consumers? Um, and so there's two other questions as well, but um, I will let you read them, keep you on your toes and read them later. So addressing these questions um, would certainly uh, be enhanced by some multidisciplinary research and data and education we discussed in the um, working group. In particular, um, uh, we think that traditional approaches in economics uh, would be nicely complemented by behavioral and experimental economics um, on figuring out consumer food preferences. So not to say that you know the old the old ways are the, are the not they're not useful, but they can be very complemented by these new approaches. And this would imply a push for more behavioral econ and experimental econ in school training. Uh, we could also benefit by collaborating with other scientists wor working in, the f in food and other disciplines and other sectors to figure out how to develop a safe, healthy, and affordable system, a food system um, that's, that's catered to what consumers want. This would imply a bit more outreach in our profession as well as making results from what we do know more accessible to them. So. Um, that's pretty much a summary of what we did in our working group, but the details are in. Time for one quick question. Okay, hold your question. Well, there'll be time at the end as well. So as we wrap up, we're gonna have uh, some discussion as well. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I actually wasn't a part of the working group that developed this, uh, but I did help out with the document that was uh, produced. And I want to give thanks and uh, credit to Craig Gunderson, who um, wrote the initial draft, and uh, Josh Burning also contributed in some edits, and I think Ellen also uh, contributed. So um, I've uh, been asked to talk about food security in the US, and um, I think this is a topic that's of great importance. It's one that I'm particularly interested in, given that I live in the rural South, um, particularly in Alabama, uh, where food insecurity rates are relatively high, higher than the national average. So I want to be clear about what, what we mean by food security because I've been in several conversations with folks where some have thought it meant more like bioterrorism, but food security in this context is very much about people having access, adequate access to nutritious food. U.S. food security is evaluated at, uh, by USDA through uh, a survey that's done in the current population survey, um, CPS, and it's a food security module that's uh, administered every December. Over the last, um, the last time that this was evaluated, household food security rate was estimated to be about 14% of U.S. households. That's about 48 million um, individuals in the U.S. are having difficulty accessing food. 
teaching graduate students about food security in the U.S. when you're in a class of uh, people from all over the world, they sometimes look at me and think, well, that's not a real problem here in the U.S. And I think these data begin to suggest that, no, there is actually an issue to be considered. And we are concerned about food security and we have something to say about food security. If for no other reason, we can see very clearly that uh, research has been done that suggests that food insecurity has direct relationships to health outcomes. Um, and our presentation, our keynote address, which I actually shouldn't have to say anything more because she covered everything really relevant to this discussion, but it points that there it could be not only effects in terms of metabolic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, but also we see that there could be long-term life course events that may be affected negatively by food insecurity. So for us to be a part of that conversation, it is really important. But food insecurity is not equally distributed amongst the U.S. If you look at maps that, um, which were excluded from this document for good reasons, but if you look at maps of U.S. food insecurity by groups like Feeding America, one of the things that you'll discover is food insecurity is highly concentrated in certain areas. Even if you just look at the USDA uh, data or ERS data that specifically talks about food insecurity rates by state, you can see different uh, differences in uh, the regions, particularly in the Delta, uh, the Mississippi Delta along Appalachia, and also in what are called Black Belt counties, those um, uh, counties throughout the South that cut across from Ari um, Arizona, Arkansas, all the way up to the Carolinas. We are concerned about food security not only because of distributional effects, because of the um, health outcomes, but the U.S. Department of uh, the U.S. government actually spends a great deal of money to actually help address food insecurity in the U.S. If you look at the U.S. Farm Bill, uh, food policy, food programs um, like SNAP, like WIC, um, and others are the largest part of the U.S. Farm Bill. So we're spending a great deal of money on this, and this is very much relevant for what we are concerned about as not only as U.S. citizens, but if you think about why a lot of us got involved in economics, maybe I'm speaking of myself, it was wanted to help people and wanted to help improve the well-being of others. So I think for all of these reasons, we can see the importance of looking at food security. There are a number of questions that the group came up with that I'll make a quick reference to, um, and I'll pass the mic along. Um, one of the things that um, has not been explored very well um, is this idea of, well, we're interested in food security, but how is food security distributed differently, not only across households, but within households. Um, we know that food security rates or, or food insecurity is worse in households with children, um, with uh, families with mothers uh, who are single mothers. We know that to be a fact, but are there differences within the household? Who gets better access? And this is very much the work that we've seen come out of the development literature in international settings, but it's still relevant for us here in the U.S. And related to this idea of distributional effects, one of the things that has been shown over and over again that when you look at different types of households, African American, Latino, immigrant households, we see higher rates of food insecurity. Some of the work that Craig Gunderson has done has shown that when you look at Native American populations, their food security rates are much, food insecurity rates are much higher than what would be explained by household composition. So there's a need to really think about what's going on, why are there differences that happen in those households. Um, there are some other ways of thinking about food security in terms of how we begin solving it. Of course, we know about SNAP and WIC and other um, federal assistance programs, but we need to think about how effective are these programs and do these programs have the intended consequences? Obviously, they may reduce the likelihood of someone being food insecure, but what does it mean in terms of their access to food and what kinds of foods that they're eating? I'll last uh, bring up the issue of different organizations that may be involved in food security or improving food security. And organizations like Feeding America with food banking and the food banking system has played an important role in providing access to food. As applied economists, what can we do to help those agencies do a better job? And I see Karen has shown me the pink sign to shut up, so I will move the mic on. All right, so thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, um, thanks very much. 
for the opportunity to participate. I wasn't involved in the design of the current draft. Um, time's up already? Oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 um, but I think the authors have done a, a wonderful job. Uh, can we get this moved down? Um, Okay, great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I was also asked to deal with trade development and conflict. Um, so uh, I think economic development is critical for poverty reduction, creating opportunities in poor countries. The, the statistics are appalling um, on poverty and on food insecurity globally, although the situation has improved dramatically in the last 25 years. Um, clearly, poverty and underdevelopment have many adverse impacts on human development opportunities, both directly, it's really hard for poor people to ensure, uh, to, to maintain their health, to ensure that their children get an adequate uh, education. Another channel through which poverty has adverse impacts is through the increased risk of civil conflict especially where you've got resource-dependent economies, seizable resources, whether they be oil or cattle or, do or conflict diamonds. Um, you know, this is a huge problem that promotes and, and, and feeds um, into uh, uh, conflict, which then intensifies poverty. Conflict countries are at the bottom on pretty much all of the measures of social development. Um, it's very likely that um, the uh, if, if current trends continue, poverty will be concentrated almost exclusively in, in conflict countries in 20, 25 years. Um, so what's needed? Now, Adam Smith, in 1755, 21 years before he wrote our founding document, um, said that all that was needed to go from barbarity to the highest level of opulence was peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. I think that's a very, very uh, necessary uh, condition. And by the time he wrote The Wealth of Nations, um, he was actually arguing for universal education um, and for inf infrastructure, two of the four items that are listed uh, in, the, in the current draft as, as folks are, uh, focal points for economic development. Um, he didn't talk so much about improving agricultural technology, I don't think uh, he really envisaged uh, conflicts over GMOs uh, at the time, but all of us have limited poor crystal balls, uh, even Adam Smith. Um, and the facilitation of off-farm employment, the movement of labour off, off the farm, which is so critical to the development process, um, and poverty reduction. I'd also like to touch you know, on sensible trade policy um, and social safety nets as very, very important uh, influences on um, social development uh, and poverty reduction. So trade and food security, my, my uh, area of most passionate interest, um, I think we need to consider two things, impacts on in income levels um, and stability impact. So income gains from trade, absent um, trade, the costs of producing food would vary enormously um, between countries. You get a lot of focus on local production, self-sufficiency and so on, but this runs aground on this fundamental constraint. Um, detailed studies point to large gains from trade within large countries. I think some of the Dave Donaldson work recently, Costa Mel and Donaldson, within the US and of course between countries as, as regions specialise in their comparative advantage rather than trying to focus on producing what, what's consumed locally. Um, there are also substantial increases in productivity associated with trade, both in agricultural products and also in intermediate inputs like fertilizers and pumps and so on. Um, just the, the importance of the sort of factor endowment. I mean, imagine trying to produce um, enough food to meet consumer demand in countries like Japan and Korea, which have so, so is the world average and it's been declining because of rising population and raising productivity. Um, Japan and Korea, which have a fifth of the arable land that China does. Everyone knows that China has very little agricultural land. Um, Korea and Japan have much, much less. The cost of trying to produce all the food in those countries um, is, is uh, enormous. And then you have most agricultural exports now come from developing countries. Only 20% of world agricultural trade is the traditional stuff that moves from one industrial country. Um, to, to another. Stability impacts, price instability is often a concern, one of the major foci of, of uh, 
in NGOs frequently is, oh gosh, you know, opening up to trade increases price instability, the volatility of the world market imposed on poor peasants. Well, supply is the most common source of volatility. Um, you know, in the Bible it says don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversification is good. If you try to rely on just what you produce locally, you're bound to suffer much greater volatility than you would um, in an integrated market. Just some simple calculations there. Wheat and, and rice price shocks are going to be vastly smaller if you've got and the benefit of an integrated market. Burgess and Donaldson, really interesting paper, connecting a district to the rail network in India, opening up to trade, reduced famine frequency um, absolutely uh, dramatically. Um, now, stabilization and trade policy, small countries and even large countries can actually stabilize their domestic prices fairly easy with something like um, the, uh, the old-fashioned European variable legend. Um, unless trade costs are very large, they can go a long way towards stabilizing prices. Many countries do this. You know, it's, a, it's, it's not supposed to be variable levies are outlawed under the WTO, but it, the same sort of measure can, can and is used. Um, but some countries use active trade policy enormously and ended up with massive internal volatility. This happens very much, very often in Africa because countries are focusing on um, on availability, they're not focusing on the access of poor, vulnerable people to food uh, that Norbert identified as the critical level. The big problem at the global level, individual country stabilization, the most countries that are using essentially variable levies to stabilize their domestic prices, that exacerbates price spikes and slumps. Um, export restrictions go on in 2008, world prices spike. Um, there's really a strong case for coordination, um, but it's very, very difficult, especially in the current political environment where trade is seen um, as a big problem, even um, in rich countries where political leaders should know better. Um, conclusions, uh, conflict management, critical for development, just as critical as it was when Adam Smith wrote in, uh, young Adam Smith wrote in 1755. Um, but peace, easy taxes and justice aren't, um, aren't enough. We need activist development policies to address market failures like the public good issues, education issues in rural areas, and mechanisms to manage trade and collective action problems. So, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Ethan's going to tell us about big data. Okay. Thank you. I've was blocked off from a lot of people by that pillar, so I thought I'd come up here. Uh, but I don't have a PowerPoint. But anyway, uh, first of all, I want to applaud the, the leadership that has created this initiative and brought us to this point. Uh, thank you for doing that. I think it demonstrates a great deal of wisdom. Uh, I'm asked to talk to you briefly about big data. I think one of the challenges that we have in this arena is to separate out the buzz from substance. I think there is both at play here. Uh, we have to be able to uh, figure out where we can uh, be engaged and relevant in this area and where uh, there, this is a lot of hype and, and a lot of attention for something that's not going to last very long. Um, so, and that's a part of what this draft is about and I think that we also, you, you know, when you go do the retreat and do SWOT analysis, you always talk about opportunities and threats. I think for us as a profession, big data presents both. It presents opportunities and it presents threats to us. Um, I, one of the things in the, the pre-conference uh, that we had on Saturday that had about 130 people registered and several more that wanted to get in is an example of this. But if you were not a part of that, what we did in the afternoon was to break out into four general areas that dealt with production, that dealt with the food chain, the value chain, environmental and sustainability, and consumer demand. I think one of the reasons that this area is of interest to our profession to the degree that it is, is because it potentially touches upon a lot of different things that we do. So this may be uh, collecting uh, Facebook scrapings to look at consumer demand, it may be RFID tags to, valid, to track uh, meat back to the place of origin and birth. 
Uh, it may be the ability to validate sustainability of production uh, and, and, and environmental indicators that are coming off sensor data and obviously in the production arena uh, the information that is flowing in, a lot of machine data and the like, has the potential to make some kind of old-fashioned subjects like farm management production functions of interest again. Um, I think it, when we talk about this data, we also have to recognize that here in the United States, we are often envied for the quality of data that our government produces and collects for us and makes available to us as a profession. And at, at our priorities and solutions meeting, James Rakeman spoke up as an editor about the fact that much of our work follows the data. Where data exists, we go. Where data does not exist, we don't answer really important questions like we should. And so I think that the availability of data to our profession is so very important and it doesn't just magically happen at ERS and at NAS and at other agencies as well. Uh, I think we have some challenges out there in terms of, of the data world that we live in because much of the data that is of interest to us today is now in the hands of private entities. It may be coming off machinery and going to private sector uh, and, and not necessarily to university researchers, not necessarily to USDA. Uh, and those are the kind of things that we need to think about. Uh, finding, and, and I think uh, this document cites the Houston Capallo and, and Antle paper from 2015, which I think is particularly relevant, and, and there's a diagram in that paper that is good in terms of thinking about how we can put these different pieces of data together. Uh, Gene is telling me that my time's up, but one thing that I would like to say before I step down is that I do think that we really need to think on a couple of issues. One is, I think that the analytical techniques are going to change. We need to be training our students to deal with spatial data, with the analytical techniques that are involved here. I think we also need to be thinking as a profession about research funding that would facilitate the kind of multidisciplinary teamwork that, that agricultural economics should be a very important part of. And I will stop there. Thank you.